Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are connecting from today. Thank you so much for being here and for being part of this conversation. I think this will most likely be our last conversation, our last event, our last chat of 2022. I still can't believe it is already the end of the year and that we are only three and a half weeks away from 2023. Re remember when we were talking about the future 20 years ago, you know, whenever 2020, 2020 comes, 2022, 2023, where, you know, now it's that moment. So it's exciting, a uh, whole world of opportunities ahead of us. And of course, part of those opportunities, part of the, uh, I think the, the many possibilities that we have ahead of us, specifically in the space of HR, is uh, how to use technology to help us do our work even more effectively, more efficiently. And for us to bring technology on board, technology that works for the purposes that we want it to work for, we also have to be very uh, good at understanding uh, how to create a business case to sell that technology to those who have financial decision-making power in our organizations, how to think about creating the business case, what is the impact, the opportunities, the potential challenges, the costs, uh, the collaborators that we need to bring all together uh, when we're thinking about technology in the space of HR. So that's what this conversation today is about, is uh, a nature tech buyer's guide of sorts so that you can think about how to create the case for HR technology in 2023. And very specifically, we're going to be focusing this conversation in very general insights about how to think uh, in terms of HR technology, but at the same time, uh, the specifics of the talent attraction, retention, recruitment technologies. We know that uh, the space of talent attraction and retention continue to be uh, one of the hottest uh, sort of spaces and topics and challenges in the space of HR. So I'm hoping that you enjoy this conversation, that you learn a lot and get a lot of value out of it, and that it helps you create the case for technology in 2023 and to help you at the end of the day, become better at doing your work in HR. And before welcoming our two panelists, I want to ask everybody, please introduce yourselves. Please let us know where you are connecting from. So just put in the chat where you're connecting from and you know, country, city, what do you do, whatever else you wanna share. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to post it in the chat. And at the same time, I also want to ask you, what do you think uh, are going to be your specific main challenges when it comes to HR technology in 2023. So please post that in the chat. And without further ado, I'm going to welcome our panelists today, Chris and Josh. Hello, guys. Welcome to the conversation. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, you guys don't know this, but when, when I started hacking HR at the end of 2017, sort of the purpose of the community was to connect, bring closer the world of technology and the world of HR. So it's like we're going back one loop uh, into that cycle because we are ending this year by talking uh, about technology and HR. So it's a very exciting uh, opportunity to talk about this and to share these insights with, of course, all the community. So let's begin here. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. So please let us know your name, where you're connecting from, what do you do, any experience that you want to share with the audience so that they know more about who you are. So Chris, why don't we kick off with you? Great, yeah, thanks Enrique. Uh, so so excited to be here. I love your energy and your passion around kind of you know HR technology and the future of work. I think it's great. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, name's Chris Smeltzer. I'm, I'm a director at Scott Madden. Scott Madden is a management consulting firm. We do a lot in the energy industry, but we do a lot in what we call our corporate and shared services practice, where we support kind of back office organizations or enabling functions, really kind of optimize their operating models. And me specifically, I work with a lot of HR enterprise functions, helping them you know, design their HR operating model and what goes into that, right? And a lot of times it's, you know, how do we think about procuring technology that fits to our operating model that can help, you know, help us increase speed, help us increase the employee experience and increase the candidate experience. 
So I've worked with a variety of organizations, really helping them kind of carve out what are those requirements they need as they're thinking about going to procure a, a HR technology to help, you know, enhance their mod or model and provide solutions for them. And from this experience, I've, I've learned a lot about, you know, how to think about and buy HR technology. And, and I've had the privilege of working with uh, the, the, the other group on this called Paradox in a couple instances, helping bring their great talent acquisition technology into a few organizations to help optimize some talent acquisition functions and operating models. So I'm really, really, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really grateful for, for it and looking forward to kind of having the comfort the opportunity to have the conversation to, to share some of the great learnings I've had, not only working with Paradox, but working with um, some of the other organizations that I have. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Welcome to the conversation. And I am sure that we're going to be getting as much knowledge out of you from all your experience working with HR, HR technology, creating the case for HR technology. And uh, so it's going to be an exciting conversation. Thank you so much, Chris. Welcome. Uh, Josh, hello. Hi, Enrique. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Good. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you know, I, I love uh, your background. So why don't you share more about what you've done throughout your career with the audience? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm approaching a 20-year practitioner in, in HR, um, held leadership roles in HR um, at Abercrombie & Fitch, was head of global TA, um, associate engagement, and uh, philanthropy there. And then was uh, honored to be able to be the global head of uh, talent acquisition and talent strategy at McDonald's. Um, and so got to, to do a lot of transformation work there with their really innovative, innovative team. I'll kind of get into a little bit of that because I think it frames up the, the conversation here. Um, but I think what we found actually ties really into how you how you open this, um, you know, this, this broadcast, Enrique, which is, you know, with through through leveraging automation within some of our transformation, leveraging technology, we actually were able to find ways to have our HR teams spend more time with people. Um, so it wasn't about just replacing people with technology. It was actually about automating some of these tasks where we were spending a ton of manual time to then be able to put our efforts towards things that are much higher value. And, and I think that was a really um, helpful frame for us. Um, after McDonald's, um, due to uh, an amazing partnership, I, I got to kind of um, be a part of a team that did what felt like one of the world's largest RFPs for HR transformation. Uh, we met this company, Paradox, whose, whose mission is to um, you know, give everyone, a, you know, 20, every recruiting team, a 24-7 assistant or recruiter um, that really helps your team spend more time um, with people and, and not software. So that's really kind of the paradox. And so it's automating everything from um, making applications feel much more seamless, um, you know, chatting to apply, um, allowing candidates to chat to, um, to be screened in any different language. It instantly automates scheduling, um, even nudges or allows candidates to, um, you know, reschedule their interviews um, and facilitates the um, offer and even onboarding process. So lots of different things that Paradox um, helps recruiting teams on. I um, wanted to just kind of maybe uh, frame up, though, for my McDonald's background, because I think it's really interesting for this conversation. Um, McDonald's is large, uh, one of the largest employers in, in the world. Um, just to give you some scope of that, it's, it's um, 37,000 restaurants. That's across 120 different countries. Um, in my role, I oversaw the corporate recruiting team, so head office, but then also got to um, work and assist on how do we make our hiring um, and talent strategies and restaurants across the globe better. We were doing about 2 million hires per year, um, seeing uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 million applications. Um, so really kind of this, this huge system. Um, but it's, it's interesting in kind of a couple different respects because it's huge, but it's also actually hyper local. Um, over 90% of McDonald's is franchised, um, led by some brilliant owner operators who are running anywhere from three restaurants to maybe 100 or 200 restaurants in hyper localized environments. And so, you know, when, when, I, um, when I was able to join, you know, our CEO, our CHRO had basically said, you know, you're joining, but we're expecting a lot of transformation here because we're able to tie uh, understaffed restaurants to a decrease in revenue. And we think because our restaurants are understaffed by roughly at that time, 20%, we think that Delta could be as much as two to $3 billion that we're leaving on the table. 
So it was a really appealing role for me because it, it was the first time I saw and really have seen TA at the table for HR where you're driving revenue. You're not just saving costs. You're not just trying to get a little bit better. You're trying to get 200% better, 300% better. The reason we were able to, and we'll kind of dig into this, dig into why understaffing uh, led to decreased revenues, was we were able to see a direct path where an understaffed restaurant had more turnover right? Um, you can kind of understand that because if you're the remaining staff, you may have uh, be more spread thin. It's a little bit more uh, busy within the restaurant. You might be having to take shifts that you wouldn't necessarily want to. That's resulting in slower ticket times, right? The amount of time we're able to actually like serve a customer, you know, out of a drive through Because of that, we may have a poorer customer experience or mm -hmm you're actually starting to see people drive away. If the line gets too long, right, you might drive past your drive through And so we could actually clock by the hour an understaffed restaurant bringing in less revenue. So, you know, as we talk today about, you know, building a CFO proof business case, you know, that was a really interesting kind of unlock for us, which was, you know, how do, how do we think about this, not just about a 10% improvement from our recruiting team, a little bit more efficient, but how do we actually uh, you know, transform TA to be a, a revenue driver for the business. Um, a, th a few kind of key frames that we used was, you know, we felt like in this high volume environment, and this is another thing Chris and I are going to talk about, um, you know, we thought about our frontline and high volume hourly strategy a lot differently than we thought about what we needed to do to transform our corporate hiring. In high volume, we felt like we to get a competitive advantage, we needed a really generation skip. Back to this, we needed to be 200 times better, not 10% better. And so for that, we felt like we needed to be the fastest in the market. We felt like speed really won. So speed at every point of the recruiting process, how quick it took an applicant to apply, how fast they got scheduled, how fast we interviewed them, how fast we got an offer in their hand, how fast we got them onboarded. Because we were seeing drop off at key points in the process. Mm -hmm. We saw it when they applied, we saw 30 or 50% dropping off. We saw them dropping off um, by the time we were trying to get them scheduled. That's ghosting and no-shows. And we were seeing 30 to 30 plus percent dropping off even after they accepted an, an offer to starting. So we felt like if we could reduce friction and speed that process up, we could move a lot faster. Uh, we knew automation had made leaps and bounds. And so we felt like if we could return time to managers, then we could make a huge difference there. And then we wanted to really embed our DEI strategy into even frontline hiring so that we reduced bias and provided a gold star experience. Um, ultimately, we partnered with, with Paradox. It's one of the reasons uh, you know, I'm here. It created a, a fully mobile first you know, transformative experience. It's about 18,000 restaurants now that we've rolled that out to. We automated about 95% of the process. When you think about that in McDonald's terms, wow. it's almost everything except the the person-to-person -person, um, interview, right? Yeah. Um, really simplified that. So it was end-to-end. -end. Um, you know, for us, it became, um, Paradox became our ATS, uh, which some of you may know kind of that term. Um, and then we just had some really uh, amazing results. And this kind of ties back to the CFO business case. So we were able to, to shorten our application to scheduling time from three days to three minutes. So it's almost instant. So think of how much better quality of candidate we were getting because we were moving that fast. Uh, we doubled our applications and we were getting a 99% candidate satisfaction score, even from candidates who didn't get offers. So when you think about that for a, a consumer brand like us, that overlap of candidates and customers were huge. Yeah. That ended up being a really massive benefit. Um, we improved our time to hire um, you know, back to, it was, it was costing us about, you know, anywhere from 200 to $700. So let's say an average of $500 per restaurant per day, a restaurant is understaffed. We were able to shorten our time to hire from, you know, 14 days to less than four days. So a, you're now recouping essentially that $5,000 yeah. every time you're being able to make a hire that fast. Um, and then, and then the last is just this being able to return time to our managers. We were turning about five hours per week. So where does that go? Well, that's better training. That's customer resolution. That's thinking about yeah. the business strategy. So, so excited about the, the conversation today. I'll, I'll kind of bring in some of the anecdotes from, you know, uh, the McDonald's experience, but paradox, I've been able to partner and, and kind of see, uh, GM and Amazon, Lowe's, 7-Eleven, Speedway, Olive Garden, Unilever, Dollar General partner with us 
um, in kind of their different approaches to um, buying technology and software, yeah. as well as getting to work with, um, you know, kind of the, the brilliant team at Scott Madden um, and, and Chris on, on some of these deployments. So just really kind of cool things to be able to hopefully share. No, that's, that's, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, Josh, welcome, welcome to the panel. And I, I am excited about the, the um, sort of the, the, the experience and the insights that you bring to the conversation. You mentioned a few things uh, mm -hmm. in your introduction that I think speak uh, very closely to, to what we do in Hacking HR and to what the community is looking for, right? You talked about uh, the connection between what we do in HR with the financial revenue of an organization, right? And, and that is so powerful uh, because very often we don't have that financial sort of freedom in the organization to, to uh, decide, all right, let's invest all this money in, a, in, a, in HR technology. But when you come to the CFO in your CFO proof business case, like you said before, and you say, you know, if we can uh, decrease the time that we're spending recruiting people by this amount, we're going to be not just saving costs, but making this extra amount of money. That's such a powerful business case. So we're going to be talking about all of this throughout the conversation. And uh, to, sort of to frame the, 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 the conversation and the, and the insight that I, that I would love for you to share with the audience, I, I want to begin by defining uh, how to create the business case, right, for HR technology uh, in the, in the, in the, um, at work and to make it a CFO proof business case, like you said before, Josh. So let me begin here. Let me begin by asking you, how do we define what the problem is? And very often we may see an opportunity and we may say, all right, if we do this, we're going to be saving this much money, but organizations have so many problems that they need to solve that the first question that we want to ask you is, bring me the problems, how we're going to solve them and how much money we're going to be saving or how much more money we're going to be making, right? So question for both of you, how, how do we frame the problem that we are trying to solve? And this includes how do we quantify sort of the impact that that problem has in the business? How do we think about the, the opportunities, not just in cost savings, but in revenue generation but, uh, uh, of solving that problem? So, so what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, who wants to go first here? We're talking about creating business case, and we're going to begin by defining the problem in terms of both uh, how that impacts the business and the challenges that that's, uh, that that's creating and the opportunities as well. I think, Josh, you want to go first. Oh, I was pointing to Chris. You want to take it, Chris? Uh, and then oh, I can jump Chris, yeah. I, let me give you a really good example of what I saw at, at a client. I think that really was a, a compelling business case to talk about and kind of what some of the inputs were in it, right? And so the, the problem was that we identified, right, is, you know, and Josh kind of alluded to this in a little bit of what he was talking about from his McDonald's experience, but looking at some of the application data, right, that was in the ATS, the applicant tracking system, and understanding kind of where that fall off point was, right? And so we could see that, you know, of these candidates, you know, it was taking about 35 minutes to complete the the application, but most of them were falling off at about the 15, 16 minute mark, right? And additionally, what we saw was we would, we, we would, they would do these job fairs, right? Where they would go out and they would kind of bring these hospitality workers in, do an interview on site, offer them job right away, and then move them to filling out this application online, right? And they would do this in a room. And what we noticed was these candidates, once they had the offer, sometimes even after they had the offer, they would just quit doing the application online and walk out of the job fair, right? And it was taking them time to enter all this in. But what we noticed was they were sitting there on their mobile device, Snapchatting, you know, <laughs> sending Instagram pictures, um, moving around on that thing so quickly. And so it just became this compelling story to say, you got to meet the candidate where they're at, yeah. right? And the demographic of the candidate that this organization was trying to hire was mobile first, right? And this is like in the, about the 2018 timeframe when this was happening. And so all of a sudden we were able to tell this very compelling story about, you know, we had data that showcased why, where our applicants were falling out of the process in terms of filling out the application. We had, you know, antidotes from these job fairs saying that, you know, even sometimes they get the job offer and they go into the room to complete the application on the computer, 
and they, they walk out because it takes too long. But we watch them on their phones, right? And this was a huge problem because the organization couldn't fill the hospitality jobs they needed. And if they can't fill the hospitality jobs they need, right, they're losing revenue. So it was a very compelling story that we told to begin with around why it was going to be more powerful to meet these candidates on their mobile. And that was the story we started to tell to build the business case. So I think the first step is here, being able to tell a good story that people can relate to and understand who are going to be some of those decision makers to help you, you know, raise the funding or procure the HR technology. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. And, and a couple of things that I'm hearing from, from th that telling of the story is the observability of the issue, right? I mean, it's not, you're not describing something that is hidden to, to hiring managers. They see it in their own children, maybe, you know, like how they, how quickly they go on social media and how much time they don't want to spend applying for a job on, 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 yeah. on a computer. And the second thing is that you're measuring, right? I mean, what, what's happening in that sort of recruitment process, right? People are falling out of the recruitment process. Uh, if entering a resume is taking them more than, I don't know, five minutes or whatever it is. So, yeah. uh, so, all right. So I, I love that telling the story uh, with, uh, insights of what's something that is observable and measurable. Josh, do you want to add anything here about creating the business case and framing the problem uh, to sell that business case and make it CFO, uh, a CFO proof business case, which by the way, I want to steal that phrase from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. And, and I think this is maybe a key point for us to almost break, break out um, high volume frontline recruiting and challenges and how we're going to frame those business cases uh, versus um, supporting our corporate recruiting teams. Because um, I think they're going to look a little bit different, and, and both of them are compelling. Um, so first, let's start with the high volume uh, space. Um, our teams are probably going to have to do more with less across the board next year, right? <laughs> Budgets are getting reduced. Some of our TA teams, and this is across both, our TA teams may um, minimally not grow or may even have to, to reduce in headcount. We're seeing that across, across our space. So within the high volume, I love what Chris is saying, you know, where are your points of drop off and how long is it taking you to actually hire, right? So where there's a lot of points of drop off right now, that's causing you to spend more money on, um, you know, job, job, uh, um, uh, job boards is typically right at the point of application. Um, so if you have a login or a password, especially in a frontline high volume environment, um, you're dropping usually 50 to 60% of your applicants right at that point, yeah. which is pretty wild. If you don't instantly schedule, what you see is candidates then start to apply to 12 different jobs at one time. Okay, so if you're not instantly getting to them, then that means potentially, you know, the 11 other employers are going to get to them faster. So these are a couple of different things, you know, check where there's drop off at the front and check where there's drop off between um, uh, finishing your screening questions and interview times. The average there is usually about three minutes, but um, we've seen like a massive shift to kind of this two to three minute instant scheduling structure. OK, um, then we're going to look at how many people are actually showing up to your interviews. Um, the recommendation here is get those interviews done within about 48 hours. Otherwise, you're going to have drop off and ghosting. And then you need to really automate your post offer process to hire because um, a lot in front line right now, because of how competitive it is, if you delay, you're seeing 30 to 40% drop off. Wow. We've been seeing as high as 50% drop off in some retailers. Um, typically within kind of this automated AI structure, you're getting that down to about 10 to 15%. Okay, so now let's like zoom back from all of that. And what you're basically being able to say is whatever money we're spending on job boards potentially could be better utilized in automation because then we're not only going to not have to spend that money there, but we're actually going to get more candidates faster to staff our positions. Yeah. Okay, so these are some of the solutions. But what I really love is, you know, Chris, you're, you're alluding to this too, is there are some industries where... Um, that will really benefit your stores, your restaurants, your distribution centers. But there's some industries that you all might be in where you staffing faster, similar to this McDonald's example, is actually driving business results. If you're a head of TA for a trucking or logistics company, you know, the more truck uh, drivers you have on the road, the more revenue your company is bringing in. If you're a head of TA for ho a home health care organization, the more people that you have that can go out and, and help and provide, 
for those in need, the more you're able to bring in revenue, but the more people you're actually able to, to help. If you're in charge of TA at a Compass Group or an Aramark or an Advantage Solutions that's focused on services, you know, the more people that you have to be able to, you know, staff, um, you know, staff within some of your clients or staff in some of your facilities, the more revenue you're going to be able to bring in. And so I love how people are starting to mesh the um, speed plus the conversion to be able to then actually tie to the time to fill that they can bring to their CFO to say, hey, this is actually revenue generating, not just cost and time savings. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, I think, interesting on this like high volume frontline part. Yeah. And, and why it's particularly urgent right now is we're all seeing an environment that hasn't let up really post COVID. We've got 10 million frontline jobs out there and about 5 million job seekers. So you need to find a way to give your teams a competitive advantage. Yeah. Now on the corporate side, I think it's really heightened for corporate recruiters where the teams are going to have to do more with less. They're going to be challenged to do more automation and still bring in super high quality candidates. So I think this is a slightly different game where we're going to look for ways to automate to allow for our brain trust of recruiters and advisors <laughs> to be able to spend more time with the top talent to get them all the way through the system, knowing that our budgets probably going in next year won't increase. I yeah. think one of the biggest unlocks within that area, and we saw this through our client GM, is automating the scheduling process. Um, they were spending hours, um, you know, they were having huge volume and scheduling hours um, upon hours there by instantly allowing for AI to handle that component of it. They saved $2 million in less than a year. So the, the dollars can be huge, not even just from a volume standpoint, but even the cost of potentially, um, you know, not having to expand your team to be able to get, um, you know, your rec count down or, or um, being able to get the hires that you need. So I think a couple different ways to be able to frame that. Um, yeah. and we take to, to maybe a final uh, piece on that question is I think when we build these CFO ready business cases, these are a lot of examples that can fill in. I think we bury the lead a lot. And I think that's one of the key pieces that's a flaw. What is the main uh, challenge you're solving? And what's the revenue or cost savings? You know, truly, first page, this should be you know, um, presented to your CV, C, CFO. Um, yeah. You've got probably 30 seconds to get, get their attention. So what's kind of the, the big approach? I also say you should come in ready to be able to showcase how you're going to pay for it. If you're going to pay for it from your own budget, that may mean replacing old technology. Um, it may mean shifting some headcount. But one, how are you going to pay for it? And if there's a delta, then what is that delta going to be? And what's yeah. the value con contribution of this new thing that you're bringing in? So that you can kind of really take ownership and accountability um, so that CFO knows, um, you know, really knows what's going to be returned there. Yeah, uh, there's there's one thing, uh, Josh, that we that we talk a lot about, and that is speaking the language of, of the business, right? And 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 I know for some things in HR, it is really hard to speak that financial language because there are some things that sometimes are more have more of a qualitative ROI rather than a quantitative ROI. But I love that you are pushing the audience to think. Uh, not just in terms of bringing technology on board and what problems it is solving, but really thinking this is how much money you will be making, more you will be making, or how much more uh, how much money you will be saving if you reduce, you know, the time to hire uh, by you know x amount of days or x amount of minutes. I mean, I love that you're down to the minutes, not even the days anymore, right? You're down to minutes, um, and that is such a powerful message here. For uh, those of you who are listening to this conversation and thinking, how do I present the case for HR technology and particularly recruitment? You come to your CFO and you say, well, if, you, if we keep using this technology that takes our candidates a week to apply and to hear back from us, they will never come to work for us. And that means that we won't be able to generate the 20, 30% revenue that we're losing for not staffing those job openings that we have right now uh, versus you know, bringing them on board by reducing the time from one week to five minutes and being able to staff those positions way faster. I think that's such a powerful, powerful uh, case. Let me ask you this question, guys, and I want to then move on to another topic. But this this very brief, brief question here. When we're thinking about creating the business case for HR technology, uh, one thing that I am 
that I am very passionate about in the world of HR is never doing anything alone, right? Bringing champions and, and supporters to the table with us and go like, you know, like an army together to sell and create that case and, and sell it to the financial decision makers in the organization. Who, sh who should be involved with us in creating that business case? Who should be working and collaborating with us in, in crafting it, in strengthening it, and selling it to the rest of the organization? Anybody uh, uh, wants to chime in here? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll you know, I'll take kind of two, two views of it, right? And one, I think this, this takes time right, to be able to, to get this buy-in and alignment with these groups, and especially the, the bigger the dollar amount you're talking about. But obviously, you know, finance is going to be really important, right? Your, your operators, right, some of the people who are hiring a lot of people, whether that is in the, the high volume space or it's more in the corporate space, is going to be really important, right? You know, your TA leadership is the TA technology, but broadly HR, and then I think two stakeholders that often get left out early mm. that you get down this path, then you have to go back to kind of aligning them are IT and procurement, right? So I think bringing along your, your IT leadership, right, around this is kind of what you're going to do, not, not only within HR, HR, your HRIS leadership, but also your, you know, IT leadership in the function itself. And then as well, procurement right? Kind of bringing procurement along the journey, at least having kind of sponsorship from procurement early can save so much time on the back end once you've got alignment from kind of some of these key stakeholders and, and finance, you know, HR, operations and IT. And then you have to get procurement brought in. So if you, you brought procurement along the path earlier, right, they're going to be able to really just kind of, you know, hit the go button when you're, you know, trying to go out with your RFP or actually make the final selection decision. Additionally, right, I think, back to as you're, as you're thinking about building this business case and bringing those stakeholders along, right? Kind of to that initial point I had made around telling that compelling story, right? You know, yeah, your CFO, he's, he's, he talks in dollars and you gotta have kind of some good objective numbers and in terms of what you think the savings can be as well as what they think the time can be. But also remember, your CFO is hiring people too, right? Yeah. He's feeling the pain of how long the process takes, right? So are, you know, so are some of these other leaders, right? And so not only talking to them from the, the dollars amount, right, around, um, you know, how much you're going to need to do this, but also kind of painting that compelling story to them that says, hey, look, you know, Mr. CFO, I know you've got four FP&A roles that have been open for the last nine months that you're really trying to upskill. And, you know, our corporate functions recruiter is being asked to do so much, right? How can we free up he or hers time to be able to really be out there sourcing more for, you know, the type of skill set you want in FP&A. This solution can help that, right? So helping them see those pain points as, as hiring managers, right? And not just thinking about them as, hey, I got to build a bulletproof business case, which I, I love that term, right? That's, uh, that's you know, a CF proof business case, right? That's important, but also this compelling piece of, hey, Mr. CFO, you, you're hiring too, right? And you're feeling yeah. this pain of trying to bring in finance talent into the organization. I, I, I love that. It's, it's talking to them both from the perspective of their uh, financial decision-making power, but also uh, uh, to, their, to their sort of a stance as the uh, people who are hiring to and need their teams to be, their, their open positions to be filled, filled up. So, uh, you know, great, great perspective, Chris. Thank you. Josh, uh, who do we have to get involved in these conversations? Who do we need to bring together with us to create a strong business case and to sell it properly as well. Yeah, I, I think it could end up being two groups. One group is a small subset of the other. So one is, and I totally agree with everything Chris said, one is, you know, who are you bringing to the table to just listen to the challenges and help you purchase a solution? So that's some of your key stakeholders. That's potentially um, some of your DEI leadership. Um, even some of your legal team. If you're buying something like an assessment, your IO team. So, you know, who is everybody that's impacted that you can bring in up front so that there aren't stalls down the line? I, you know, Chris, I love your take on, you know, procurement, getting them in really soon. Yeah. Uh, because if, if IT, procurement, um, 
your operations team gets like brought in more towards the end, they're going to need to see all the things that you saw on the front end and it's going to stall some of your, your projects. So bring them in so that they can really help contribute at that, that front end. I really love that. You know, an example of this for McDonald's was, you know, we had to make some of our group purchasing, um, you know, like the final calls within a, like a leadership group. But a huge component of this was like talking to all of our owner operators about what they wanted, showing them demos of the experiences we were going along so that they really felt bought in along the way. So that's part one is, you know, who are your stakeholders and how are you bringing them in up front so that there's no cold water, you know, um, you know at the like final yard line that's brought on. Now, I do think this CFO proof business case, you want to put together a small SWAT team of really at the front end of how this can get crafted. I think this is probably your um, your HR operations, um, you know, maybe lead your data um, uh, lead and, and definitely someone from finance because you need to be able to speak that language. Chris, totally agree. You need amazing storytelling within this. But if you are overestimating your numbers, you're going to lose credibility. And talking to tech vendors, they may give you their most optimistic numbers instead of the most realistic numbers. So you need to be able to have someone that's going to call out realistic returns. You need to have someone that's going to be able to differentiate between a soft return and a hard return, right? So a soft return may be, you know, um, a better brand experience, but it's going to be a little harder to measure in the short term. A hard return is we're returning these types of hours, which allowed for us to not hire two heads. It allowed for us to reduce our budget by 30% within job advertising. And we're going to come back to that six months from now and actually show you that that happened. We're going to actually sign up to this budget decrease going into next year. So your finance team is going to be really good at editing um, kind of your pitch to the CFO that's going to help you ultimately get it approved. What's hard and then what are the added benefits that are coming with it? Because those hard dollar savings, those hard dollar um, gains um, that could come from this um, will require you to be able to report back and measure in a three or six month um, you know, interval. But it's going to add so much more credibility and it's going to make that decision mm -hmm. for a CFO or a CHRO so much easier. Got it. We're going to spend X and we see that our return is going to be Y. Um, we are going to measure that return within three months to be able to kind of hold our feet to the fire. I'm also seeing you're going to pay for it by X, Y, and Z. Right. It's it's hard. And then, hey, here are all these amazing other added benefits. We're adding a better candidate experience. We're, you know, um, adding, um, um, you know, X, you know, X or Y. So um, I just kind of love that, like mini SWAT team to start to like build that and separate those hard, hard and soft uh, components to your business case. Oh, that, that's fantastic. And, and, and I think one uh, key takeaway from anybody who is uh, watching right now or will be uh, catching up the recording later is to involve, you have to involve people, your stakeholders, um, and you have to involve your finance team, you know, for many reasons, one of them for, you know, them being decision makers, them being a stakeholders at the same time of whatever you're doing, but also them being uh, knowledge and information providers, right? The people that can help you define exactly how much money you're going to be saving, how much more money you're going to be making, and, you know, when you can measure that. Uh, so that's that's a powerful part of the story, like uh, Chris and Josh are saying. I, I want to stay on this page, actually, of uh, financial uh, kind of like thinking uh, when we are creating the business case for HR technology and ask you sort of this, this uh, related question. What are the indicators uh, or the metrics that we should keep in mind when creating the case, the business case for HR technology. And I ask you this question, uh, Josh, you just said a great example, right? You just said, you know, we're going to be saving this amount of money in advertisement. And we're going to let you know about that in six months from now, how much money we saved and that we saved what we actually said that we were going to save and how we're using that money for maybe other business priorities. But what are the, the, in, the key indicators? What are the key metrics that we should take into account when creating the uh, business case for HR technology? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Enrique, it's a really good question. And I think Josh did a really, you know, answered it with a lot of what, what he, he talked about in kind of the previous question as well. You know, I think, and, and Enrique, you actually even touched on it earlier, right? For, for building the business, the HR business case to buy technology, sometimes you don't necessarily have all the 
true objective data, right? And sometimes it's, it's hard to actually really get true line of sight to, to cost per headcount, right? We have can get estimates, right? But some of the subjective stuff, we can't actually put a do dollar number around. So one of the things that, you know, we try to do and try to think about is how do you kind of build models, right? Yeah. That take into consideration some assumptions and these assumptions need to be tested with those stakeholders, right? I love Josh's kind of comment around building a little SWAT team, right? Around like kind of some of these folks bringing finance into that, right? Bringing, you know, HR data into that. Absolutely. But, you know, testing off some of these assumptions to say, you know, we think it's going to cost X, right? And here's a, or we, we think it's going to save us X. And here's a range of where we think that savings can be. And, and trying to validate those models with as many stakeholders, right? Starting with that um, SWAT team as possible along the journey while you're telling the story. So, you know, I think a lot of times what I've seen is it, it we get lost in trying to get the information, right? And sometimes it's intimidating as an HR function to try to go out and get this cost information or predict these savings that we think this technology is gonna bring us, right? But creating a model that I think can show a variance of where we think that is and having good assumptions around those variances that are tested and aligned by some of these stakeholders, I think is just like a, a really important aspect of building, you know, putting the inputs in to the business case. Yeah, I uh, thank you for sharing that, Chris, and, and 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 actually connecting with what you're saying and what Josh actually said before. Josh calls it, uh, you know, soft, uh, hard returns. I call it qualitative and quantitative mm -hmm. returns. Yeah. And some of some of those qualitative returns are very difficult mm -hmm. to measure, but you yeah. know. Uh, if you explain them well, you know that they will have an impact down the road. I mean, you you mentioned Josh brand awareness, right? Which can be also uh, you know reputation uh, of the brand, and you know you get more people trying to apply for those jobs because they believe in that company, and that's really hard. Uh, it's really hard to put a number on it, right? So, but for the things that you can actually put a number on, um, maybe uh, Josh, do you have a few indicators that you would say? Keep this in mind, this apply for the recruitment technology, but also for most HR technologies. Some key indicators that you think uh, can be measured and we can show six months down the road, uh, uh, you know, how they have changed over, you know, over time with the implementation of that technology. Yeah. Um... Okay, I'm going to give the two kind of like overarching ones that I feel like have been within our industry for a while, but we're going to break it down a little bit in a more sophisticated way than I think it's been in the past. So it's going to be cost for hire and time to hire, right? Um, the problem is I don't think we've got like great ways of like all summarizing that. So let's break them down mm -hmm. into like kind of two cases, right? Um, one is, can you pay for the, the technology? And, and we'll, we'll kind of go through this lens of time to hire and, and um, cost of hire. So one, you should have a really good grip on your full budget as the head of TA, or if you're a director of TA and you're reporting into VP of TA, this is a key thing that you need to like map out. And, and this is like a, a full ledger of every single cost that's within your, your budget that you own, because going into next year, you you may get an increase, you may get a small decrease, but you need to really look at kind of the total budget that you're operating on. So that's your advertising uh, budget. That's your current technologies. That's agencies or support that you potentially have. That's your travel budget. That's technology, right? It's, it's, um, it's your, your headcount and your staff. You have to have all of that be able to be laid out so that you really know what kind of levers you have to be able to pull. Because if you can pay for kind of the new thing that's going to transform your team through your current bucket of spend, it's going to be a lot easier to be able to move fast and get that through because your business case then for a CFO says, I'm going to be able to get a faster time to hire at a lower cost. And I'm essentially bringing in something that I can already pay for. I'm paying for it with my own money, right? As you skip to a, a, a place where you'd say, hey, given all of those things, what we need to do to improve and impact the business is actually going to require, even though we, we, we may pull down on some levers to pay for partial amounts of this, we're going to need to go to our CFO, our CHRO to ask for more money. When that happens, you need to be able to have a, a much more solid business case to be able to say, we're going to pay for this component from this level and this lever. We're going to measure the results that come in from cost per hire and time to hire. 
And we're going to define them in these ways. And ultimately, here's the expected return that we're going to have, right? And so that is really as we start to talk about this CFO business case where we're going to be you know, talking a lot on um, by uh, the impacts of the business, by if you can hire someone you know, $1,000 less because largely you're reducing the job advertising spend or you don't need to add five sourcers to your team next year to be able to to handle some of these um, these components, you know that's going to be a winning conversation to be able to get some of this this in. Um, or if you're able to increase time or speed to hire, and this is I, I love this especially within frontline work, then you you should be able to partner with your finance and your data team to say, you know, what are the costs and what are the reasons why um, you know hiring fast and keeping our restaurants, our store, our distribution centers fully staffed. Um, you know, contribute to our revenues or what's the potential revenue that we're losing? Because then it's an easier conversation to be able to go and take to your to your CFO. So I, I do think it's interesting in terms of even splitting yeah. the types of business cases that you're coming out with. I think ultimately it does come back to those two numbers because I think they're the most tied to revenue generation or cost savings. But there are different approaches. If you can pay for it yourself, um, or if you're going to need to ask for money and you need to quantify why this is one of the best investments for your company to take a limited a dollar amount um, to be able to invest into, into that. Because it's truly at that point, it's an investment. Is yeah. what you're proposing one of the best investments the company can make going into that year? And so it's a very different mindset than, hey, um, by using my current budget, I am, I am improving the efficiency of my own department. Versus I, I have an investment for you to be able to look at that can propel the business and is one of the best 20 investments you can make for your company this year. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that you expanded the uh, sort of the scope of the question beyond just the indicators to also address how important it is for those who are presenting the business case to say, we want to bring new technology on board. It's going to help us, uh, you know, solve some of the challenges that we have. And we can, we have the money to do that because we're already spending this, this money in other buckets. We're just going to be, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, moving the m money around. Or uh, if you actually need the extra money, it becomes an investment because then you're saving it down the line, you know, with all, by improving uh, those indicators uh, that, that we talked about. So Josh, thank you so much for that. One of the things that really scares uh, HR people when it comes to technology is not not the selling of the technology internally, not the uh, implementation of the technology, but what happens after, right? All the change management that has to happen around uh, teaching people how to use the new technology, educating your stakeholders, even educating your the community that you're serving that now you have new tools that work in a little bit of a different way. What are your thoughts on that process, right? On, on, on how the change management uh, post uh, approval for new technology look like? Yeah. <laughs> Chris, go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one. So yeah, I think you're right, right? It's, you know, what we've walked around, walked through, right? It's just kind of, how do you get to buy the technology? And then once you've bought it and you implement it, how do you actually, you know, drive the right behavior changes with it, right? And there, there is a significant amount of change when you, when you, you know, incorporate a new technology, especially like something, you know, as disruptive as, as Paradox's solution, right? It's an, it's an awesome solution and it really changes the role of the recruiter in the best way, whether it's, you know, someone who's doing high volume or kind of to Josh's point, which is bifurcating, somebody who's doing salaried recruiting, right? If I, if I completely remove all your time that you were spending trying to schedule time with candidates, what do you do now? Right. And so, you know, this, <laughs> this is the part that, that takes time, right? And I think you got to lay out a few specific metrics to think about to say, how do we really measure, you know, if the change is working, right? How do we measure adoption, right? How many people are using it, right? How do we, you know, how do we measure, are they using it in the way that we perceived them to use it? How do we measure, are there new use cases that we didn't even originally think about that we could start to adopt to use this technology for. So getting clear on, I think, what are some of the things you you want to measure in terms of whether or not the change is being successful up front is really important. 
But the other piece, I think, to help get the buy-in and, and the adoption is bringing the, the users in along to understand like what's working for you, right? What, what isn't working for you? What do you understand? What do you still don't understand, right? And offering really kind of, you know, a variety of points in time for them to come in and, and share how it's working and how it isn't working. I think I just want to mention one thing, you know, in, in the work we've done in, in, with Paradox, right? I think one of the, one of the great um, benefits of working with a technology partner like Paradox is they, they bring their people into the fold to really help, you know, understand how the recruiters are using the solution and then, you know, make code configurations to be able to amend that technology to, to how those recruiters are using it, right? And so that, I think that's really important in adoption of technology, right? I think that, you know, if we think about as individuals, right, and all the technology we use in our day-to-day lives, right? You know, think of any social media platform that you're on or any website that you visit frequently, right? That technology evolves with how we use it, right? And they look at that data to understand, right? What are, what are users doing with a said technology? And a lot of time in the organization, we just, we implement the technology and then we kind of forget about it, yeah. right? And so ensuring that you're setting up kind of regular cadences with your users, right? Recruiters, hiring managers, you know, HRIS, to pull them in terms of what's working, what's not working, what would be better features, right? What else maybe should it plug into? Kind of what other reports should it pull? And then working to prioritize those changes that you can make as a as an owner of that technology, or if you're working with a really good vendor like a Paradox, you know, partnering with them to help configure that and make those tailored changes that are going to increase adoption for your users in your organization. Yeah, it's a very comprehensive. Um... Uh, sort of approach, right, to think about the change management from all possible perspectives and also from the very, uh, considering the, the very learning experience that goes through the through that change management process so that you can mm-hmm. continue to educate your, you know, uh, yourself as an HR uh, leader who is, you know, uh, sort of managing the technology, but also your uh, stakeholders. So thanks, Chris. Josh, any uh, insight on the change management uh, question? Yeah, I, I love the question because I think it's it's like you need to respect the time and energy that goes into change management at the at the front end of your process because I think yeah. it changes the decisions that you're going to make. If you understand that that's going to be a key part of your like follow through of your golf swing to make this effective, then you're going to look at things through a different lens right at the start. What I mean by that is like do not buy any tech that it, if it doesn't close a significant gap or it doesn't make you 50% better within that category or area. Because otherwise, you're spending money, resources, and time to be able to not only buy that, but then actually get it set up. Yeah. And I say that with confidence because I feel like over the last three to five years, technology has gotten so much better thanks to AI that we actually can buy technology now within the space that doesn't just make us a little bit better, not 10%, but like 50%, 200 you know, 200%. Um, percent. Yeah. So by thinking about that in that way, I think that really helps. Um, And then I love what Chris said. You know, I think there are different types of vendors out there. One is a vendor that sells the tech and you're on your own to either get an agency partner to be able to set that up or to set that up within your team. And then there are others that, you know, can be able to um, that have set themselves up to be able to really help um, advise you know, partner with a Scott Madden or partner with your teams to be able to help you support that process. And they're going to introduce those resources right off the bat. You know, for, for us, we're for Paradox. I love how our CEO has set up the organization because it's definitely playing the long game. You know, we want to have yeah. the most innovative technology out there that, that helps you know, recruiting and talent professionals. But we also understand the importance of the relationship for, for a long-term sort of like innovative approach. So we want that implementation to go really smoothly. We want yeah. them to partner with us on brainstorming and innovating what's next on our roadmap and kind of a really smooth follow through. And so, yeah, I would just kind of circle back to this, you know, respect the change management process at the beginning um, so that you're asking those questions. You're buying tech that makes you 50 percent better or more so that it's worth it. And you're and you're looking at the technology through that lens, which is, you know, is this technology truly easy, intuitive? You know, if I'm teaching this or showing this to other people, are they going to instantly get it or is this going to be hours Mm -hmm. of work for them to be able to, to do it? 
No, I, I, I love that. And I hope more HR people ask themselves that question when they are thinking about HR technology, right? I mean, it's it, is it something that is intuitive for people to use or are we going to be spending hours and hours in explaining uh, how things, you know, should be, right? Which, you know, it's a uh, sort of counterintuitive to the way most technology tries to work uh, today. So uh, we are, uh, we have only a couple of minutes left and I want to ask you uh, just this last question uh, very briefly. If you can, if you can share your last three tips, ideas, insights on what to do uh, at the beginning of your journey when you are going to buy new HR technology, you know, three things uh, in bullet points, so to speak, that uh, HR people can keep in mind when they are beginning their journeys to buy new HR technology. Uh, Chris, let's begin with you. Three bullet yeah, points. Re real quick. I think the first one is get really clear on your functional requirements, mm. right? What do you want the technology to do, right? What do you want it to plug into? What kind of data do you want to get from it, right? Get really clear on those and assess the vendors against those, right? The second one is be really mindful of where you're at and just the maturity of your operating model, right? If we in introduce this technology, our R and people who are going to use it, are they ready to use it? How is it going to change their jobs, right? And then I think the third one is really, really have a, a long-term vision, right? A, a three-year roadmap for kind of how you want your technology ecosystem in HR to evolve over the course of time, right? What are the different things that you want to solve for and plug in? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, fantastic. Three bullet points. Josh, three bullet points. Three for bullet points. All right. Are, so one, for those who are beginning their journey. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, one, I just, I, HR people are, are business people. Um, you know, I think uh, you, we're going to see an increasing amount of heads of TA talent management become not only CHROs, potentially, you know, COOs and CEOs. The reason being they have a really incredible mix of learning cutting edge technology, running P&Ls, um, and understanding what talent actually drives the business. So I think when you're buying tech, you know, approach it in that, that regard. You know, if you were sitting in one of those seats, you know, how are you going to build your business plan to ensure that your investment is one of the best investments the company can make for that year? Yeah. Two is you need to create some urgency. And I think there's no better year actually going in for TA or talent to create this urgency. Like, again, our teams are going to have to do more with less, but the talent landscape is as competitive, if not more than ever. It hasn't let up. So yeah. we need to be able to go into this year showcasing that we need to, um, you know, kind of change or transform faster than we have in the past to be able to compete with, um, you know, a, a lot of the changes in the market and to be able to have a competitive advantage when, in staffing, both frontline and even getting the best talent um, for, for our professional hiring. And then the last is there is no better time to be looking at technology because technology over the last three years has completely transformed within the talent management and TA space. It's transformed for a couple different reasons. AI has gotten light years better, two, three X times. So if you haven't been in the market, start to look and feel around because the technology is now starting to feel consumer grade. It feels like the stuff, the apps that you use at home, the Amazons and Alexas of the world. And it, that is different within the last three years. The next reason is the adoption curve is a lot different than it used to be, which yeah. is COVID forced yeah. some of the largest employers of the world who saw that understaffing was impacting their business to adopt first. So you've got the McDonald's, the Kohl's, the Lowe's, the Amazons of the world who've already adopted some of the most sophisticated AI technology to help and assist their team. So that means not only is it a more competitive environment going in next year, but we have more sophisticated technology and the adoption has already started to occur there. So I think that adds to kind of the urgency that that's out yeah. there, but I think an excitement of getting your team starting to get really savvy about technology, starting to play a little bit in there and starting to practice your business cases to be able to really help you in 2023. Yeah, fantastic, Josh. Well, thank you so much, Chris, Josh. This was an amazing uh, conversation and I am sure that everybody who's tuning in right now live or who will be watching this session later on uh, is uh, walking away with great ideas, great insights on how to think about HR technology and how to create the 
case for HR technology. And for those of you who are just beginning this journey, this last question was for you. You know, uh, seven bullet points, three by Chris, four by Josh <laughs> on how to uh, begin your journey uh, to create the case for HR technology in your function. Well, Chris, Josh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I think this is the last live that we do this year. So be safe, be well, have a wonderful holiday season. And I will see you all in, well, more things uh, in January of next year. So thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.